the best way to increase your FICO score is not necessarily paying off the debt. In fact, the best way to increment your FICO is by simply asking for a line increase in your credit card, okay? Why? Well, it's very simple. Let's just think about it this way. Let's assume this is the um, the pie chart for the FICO score, right? So um, the FICO is composed of like multiple elements, but we're gonna talk about two key ones that are very important for you to pay attention. One is debt, right? So 30% of your FICO is composed of the amount of debt that you owe. And then 35 of it, it's composed of uh, timely payments. Okay. So remember what I said about the best way to increment your FICO score is not by paying your debt. By that, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pay. You should always pay your debt. Otherwise, 35% of uh, your FICO score is going to be impacted. Uh, this point right here, it's focusing on the line increase, which is the 30% that you see here. Why does that matter? Okay, well, let's just come over here. So let's say, for example, that you have a credit card debt of $5,000, right? But then your total credit line, it's also $5,000. What does that mean? That means that you have used up 100% of your credit line. That does not look good. The banks don't like it and your FICO score is certainly not like that. And therefore your FICO score is going to go down. But most people tend to want to tackle this number right here, right? The $5,000 debt. Let me go ahead and tackle it and, you know, get another job and paid it off and stuff like that. So that way I can just bring up my FICO. But there's another way that can help you increase it without having you to, you know, just break your back, getting another job and stuff like that, or like going crazy about it. And that's just simply by getting a line increase, because when you get a line increase, this is how your debt is going to look like. So let's look at this scenario. So let's say you still have your debt for $5,000, right? But now, because you know this trip, you went ahead and you called the bank and you were able to get a line increase of $15,000, right? So now this 5,000 credit line went up to $15,000. And that translates to only a 30% use of your debt or 33% to be exact for those who want to get the exact calculation, right? So you didn't have to work extra hard. You didn't have to, you know, borrow money to pay it down. You just simply asked for an online increase. And just that got you the highest FICO score. Now, moving along, the best way to ask for a credit line increase is to do it when only a soft pull is in place, okay? Not when a hard pull is in place. So for those who are hearing about this for the first time, a hard pull is one that appears in your credit report, like in your face, and it's one that also lowers your FICO score, right? So that's what it's called a heart pull. And it typically lowers your FICO score by two to three points or something like that, right? But then when we're talking about a soft pull, it does appear in your report, but it's, it's more like the side, right? Like it's not in your face and it doesn't impact your FICO. It means your FICO remains the same. So when you're going to go and call a bank and request for a credit line increase, the best way to go about it is by asking if the line increase can be done with a soft pull. You never want to go with a hard pull, okay? So that's a big no-no. So let's say, for example, let's do an exercise right here. Let's say that you find out about this trick and you want to go ahead and implement it. So you take your credit card out, you look at the 1-800 number in the back and you call them. And so the conversation will go like this, right? Hello, ma'am. How are you? I hope you're doing great. The reason why I'm calling is because I would like to request a line increase. And I was kind of hoping that that line increase could be done with a soft pull. And then you pause right there. And then you let the rep talk on the phone. And then she will probably say, well, sir, unfortunately, we cannot do that. The only way to give you a line increase is by pulling your credit. So that will require a hard pull. Well, at that point in time, you're going to thank them for their time and then just simply hang up, move on. That's not the right bank you want to work with. You're going to take out another credit card and then you're going to run through the same script and you're going to ask them if it's possible to increase your credit line using a soft pull. And if they say yes, voila, you already got your increase. You ask for how much you want. I typically do 50% uh, more. So if your credit line is $7,000, I ask for an additional $3,500. That's just the golden rule that has worked for me. Uh, anything higher than that, I never tend to get. So why bother? So I usually ask 
pass or 50% of my standard credit line. And that usually works out. So now you know, and hopefully you can implement that as well. But before we do that, if you're enjoying this episode, let me remind you to hit the like button right here at the bottom so you can help this episode rank and help others like you who are looking for information of this kind. Now, the administration, okay? If you think about it, when you have 70 credit cards, it's very difficult to manage them because most likely you didn't get approved for all 70 credit cards in one day. You got them approved over a period of, I don't know, months, sometimes even years, right? So when that happens, you typically don't have the same due date. Some credit cards are due the first of the month. Some credit cards are due the third, the fifth, the sixth of the month. And trying to pay that credit card debt separately for each and one of your cards will become a mess because it's very, very likely that you will forget to pay at least one or two of them, right? So you definitely don't want to put yourself in that situation. So what I like to do is that I move all of my due dates in the credit cards. And for those who don't know what a due date is, is basically the date where you have to pay, okay? So I move all my due dates to the 27 of each month. And then on the 27, I block an hour or two and I pay all my credit cards, okay? So that way I make sure that all my credit cards in the list are all taken care of and that way I don't have to worry whether one was late or not paid or whatsoever, right? Now, automated payments, okay? Always, always, always set up automatic payments for your credit cards because life happens. Life catches up to you. You can be the most organized person in the world and you can sit down and jot down in your agenda or your calendar that, hey, on the 27th, I'm always going to pay my card. But life happens. It sometimes throws curveballs at us and we have surprises. We have things that we did not foresee and sometimes it takes our attention away from having to pay the credit card. And so having an automatic payment for at least the minimum amount, it's going to save your credit from going downhill because, hey, timely payments is 35% of your FICO score. So make sure you pay attention to that, okay? So how do you know exactly what's the minimum amount? What do you pay, yada, yada? Well, every time you go into your bank application, there's a minimum amount that is automated by the system. So all you gotta do is just to simply activate the automatic payment and all your cards get paid. Just to give you an example of what happened to me um, a couple of months ago, because I'm actually on the road a lot. I have been traveling a lot for business and um, there's been instances where I have forgotten a couple of times uh, to pay my credit card. But thanks to this, my credit is still spotless. Let's say for example, that out of that 70 credit cards that I talked about in the title, we're gonna do an exercise with three. So you have credit card one, credit card two, and then credit card three. So on credit card one, the minimum payment generated by the system is $35. The minimum Minimum payment on the second car, let's say it's 70, and then the minimum payment of the third is $50, right? So on the 27, the system religiously charged 35, 70, and $50. I'm good. I don't have to worry about it. And everything has been taken care of. However, the debt is still there, right? I'm pretty sure that if you guys have a minimum payment of some sort, 75, 70, or 50, you call it whatever, it is very likely that your debt is actually higher than that amount. So let's say, for example, on these cars, my debt on this car was 500, and this one was 3,000, and then on this one was, I don't know, 6,000 or something like that. I'm just making numbers up. So yes, the auto payment did take place, but I want to reduce my debt even further by tackling this part. So I let the automated payment happen. And then down the road, hey, I remember like, oh my God, yeah, uh, I actually want to reduce this even further. So then I manually come in and I start taking care of the debt. So let's say I completely paid off this car. Uh, I pay 465 because the 35 minimum payment already took place. So now this is completely taken care of. Maybe this car, I want to pay an additional 500. And then on this one, I want to pay an additional 500. So that way I'm actually lowering the debt on my credit cards. Yes, it might seem a little bit complicated. You're probably wondering, hey, why would you do this when you can actually just come in and do the manual payments? Yes, I know I can do that. But the reason why I'm setting up automatic payments is because I want to make sure that the payments are always made on time, even if I'm gonna do a manual payment. But if you do the automated payment and you make sure it goes through every time, even on the days that you're having, I don't know, the worst days and, and something catches your attention, at least you're not gonna hurt your FICO, okay? Deal with the 
drama on your own, but let automation take care of your FICO, okay? Now, the million dollar question, how do you check your credit? Well, there are multiple ways to do that. One is through the credit bureaus, and by bureaus, I'm talking about Equifax, we talk about Experian, or TransUnion. And then there's another way to check it with a very popular application called Credit Karma. Now, these over here use the FICO score and Credit Karma over here uses the Vantage score, okay? So this episode, it's gonna be about the FICO score, not about the Vantage score. Now, it is time to go into the nitty gritty. So we have a sample report right here from Experian, and this was provided by our, our good friend, Chepito Gonzalez, a very popular character at Nova Rice, and this is his Experian report. So let's go ahead and run through this report so you can understand what each line means for you and what you can do about that information. Now, for those who are curious, you can have access to a report like this if you create an Experian account. For those who are interested, there's an episode that I created a couple of months ago where I actually show you step-by-step -step how you can actually create an account in Experian and get access to a free report and you can access this once a year, okay? So now, back to this particular report right here. Let's just go ahead and get started. And what the first thing that you're gonna see is that the FICO score that they're utilizing in this equation is the FICO A. So make sure you take a note of that. And then of course, so we have Chibito's uh, breakdown of the FICO score and his FICO is at 727, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's good, right? It's not excellent, but it's good. It will get you a good rate on a mortgage. Then on the left side here, I need you to pay attention because it will give you the summary. So Chepito has a total of 17 accounts, so you need to check those as well for you. There's a total of two accounts that were laid on his profile, and then 18 that were closed, so we wanna check into that. And now this is the part where I want you to pay attention to. So his oldest account is 15 years and five months old. But then when you lump everything together and you include all of your credit cards together, in this case, all of Chipito's cards together, we're talking about an average of six years. Not bad, it can improve, right? And now over here, we're gonna talk about the credit usage. This has created a lot of confusion. Everybody keeps talking about the 30%, 30%. 30%. For those who are actually interested about what am I referencing to regarding the whole 30%, here's a video that you can actually check out so uh, you can get that doubt out of the equation, but do it after we're done with this video. In the meantime, stay on this report right here because it's really important. So the overall credit usage of Chapito is 34%. His total credit limit is $102,900. And so far he has used $34,749. Could he use some improvement? Yeah, it could be brought down to 30% depending on what you're looking for. But it doesn't have to be if you're not looking to get any financing, right? Now, on the right side, there's his debt summary. So we're talking about the total credit card line that he has, that's $35,000 if we were to round it up. And there's a loan debt of 102,507. Hey, that could be a mortgage, that could be a car loan, who knows? And the good news is that there's nothing in collection. Okay, he has nothing that is falling under collection. And if you happen to have something that it's on this side of the equation under collection, make sure you call your lender to sort that out. Make sure you figure that out, you fix it because you definitely do not want that on your record, okay? Now, moving along, we're gonna talk about page two. So this is where your personal information is gonna be located. So this is something that you have to corroborate. You have to make sure it has been vetted, that it is accurate, because that's how um, identities get messed up and that's how your social security winds up being connected to someone else's name. So you have to make sure that whatever you see here is accurate. So our customer right here is Chepito Gonzalez. He goes by Gonzalez Chepitos. I mean, that's, you know, one way to go about it. It's turned around Chepito M. Gonzalez. Maybe that's his middle name over here. Now we have Chepito Gonzalez Becerra. Maybe that's his second last name. Chepito G. Becerra. Okay, I don't know. Maybe that's something that he needs to look into. Maybe people are thinking that Gonzalez is his middle name, maybe he might want to have that sort out or maybe that M needs to be sort out. 
I don't know. But this is something that you need to look into to make sure that your information is being accurate. And whatever is not accurate, you have to call, in this case, you have to call the credit bureau, in this case, this experience, to let them know that they need to update that information. Then on this side, there are the addresses that he has lived in before. His current address is 123 Main Street in La La Land, but then his prior addresses involve 456 Main Street and 789 Main Street. So he checked those, those are accurate. And then on the right side are his employer. Is that clear? Is that correct? Is that accurate? Yes, no, call, okay? As we are going down, now you're gonna get access to the actual number of accounts. So you're gonna get one by one, every single account, and it's gonna show you the history so let's say, for example, I want to stop by on one of his account in Bank of America. So you verify, okay, this is accurate. This is my account. Um, this is the number. You verify that with your credit card number. You check that the date that was open is accurate. And then most importantly, you check that, hey, the amount that you're due or whatever limit is also accurate. You want to make sure you check that out. Is the balance accurate? Do you still owe money on it? Is it zero? Hey, maybe you need to call them. And then this part right here under payment history is extremely important because your payment history makes up a big chunk of your credit score, okay? And you can see that in Chapito's case, it is beautiful, gorgeous. Everything is on time. He has, as you can see here, an exceptional payment history. And that's what you want to geared towards. Uh, perhaps you don't have an exceptional yet, but you will because that's what you want to get. And how do you get an exceptional payment history? By always paying on time, as you can see here. Lots and lots of green dots, right? And then on the areas where you see um, a dash over here, that's just simply because the data is unavailable. So great stuff. Let's assume you spotted something that you're checking your report and there's something that's completely off. It shows that you didn't make a payment on time, yada, yada. Now you have to contact them and prove them evidence. So a way to contact the lender is by either sending them a mail over here or just by calling them directly to their phone number. So every single account that you have, as you can see, will provide you with the contact information, a phone number, and that's with every single account. Now, let's just go down and take a look at how a mortgage will look on your account. There you go. So we have a mortgage here. So we have first house mortgage, first house, this is the account. Make sure this is a mortgage when it was opened and then the balance is left. How much have you paid off so far? What was the loan original amount? Make sure that's accurate as well. And the term of it, but then look at this, so beautiful, so many years, and look at all the timely online payments. This is what you wanna to gear towards. This is what you wanna show. It has to be accurate, and you want to make sure you always have exceptional payment history, right? Now, let's just check out one more, and I wanna take you to an auto loan. Here we go. So we have JP Auto Finance, JPMC Auto Finance. There's the account number right here, nicely looking. Then you get the auto loan, uh, the date that it was open. Then you check over here. Is that really the balance that you still owe? When was it last updated? This is the original amount. And then look at the payment history. It seems like it's um, there's some data that's missing over here, but hey, I'd rather have either greens or data unavailable that's something in red telling me that I pay late, okay? So this is how it looks. Now let's just scroll down and take a closer look to the closed accounts, right? So these are accounts that Chipito used to have and just because they're closed doesn't mean you don't get to pay attention to them. You still need to validate them because hey, you wanna make sure that they are your accounts, right? And you need to make sure that the information that is reflected in there, it's also accurate because it stays on your report for seven years. So it will haunt you for seven years if something is bad on it, right? So let's say for example, we have this account here, this is an Amex account, and when you zoom in, you will see immediately that Chepito has had three late payments in this account, right? So he checks the account number, it is a credit card, this is the date that it was open, uh, it was past due for 90 days, uh-oh, that's not good, so let's see when did that happen. So um, it seems that he forgot to pay in 30 days, and then in December over here, he forgot to pay in 60 days. But then in January, he had the longest. That's a 90 day delay on the payment. That is not good. Perhaps this is inaccurate and Chapito needs to call. 
same thing with you. If you see something that jumps out of your eyes and it doesn't look right, you need to call them and correct them. And of course, show them evidence that, hey, I did pay it on time. But if it's here, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it won't look good. You can provide an explanation as to what happened. Hey, maybe a family emergency happened around here. Or maybe over here, he thought that an automated payment was set up, but it turns out that it wasn't set up and he missed payments for, you know, three months in a row because he thought that everything was being paid automatically. I don't know, right? But the beauty about this is that after seven years, this will disappear. And let's say, let's continue. Now, let's just check out another account. Hey, well, there's a close account here, but guess what? He had an exceptional payment history. And look at this. Look at all of these years with payment history. But guess what happened? He closed the account. Ha, huh, I guess Chapita knows better now. He made a mistake of closing the account back then, but look at all the years of credit history that he let go. What would have happened to his credit record if all of these timely payments and all of these years happen to be registered in his credit history. So you're watching this episode so you can learn. So never, never close a credit card. And if you wanna know why, if you wanna know the best way to take care of a credit card that you don't want in your queue or in your portfolio, but you don't wanna close it because you don't wanna hurt your credit, here's a video over here that you can certainly check out that's gonna help you navigate through the whole talk of closing a credit card or not. And then let's just move along. Let's just check out another close account just to give you a better sense. But I wanna look for a car loan over here. And there you go. So we have his car loan also closed, but look, he has Megano car loans over here, the account number, secure loan. This is how it looks, pay satisfactorily. Um, the balance was updated, yada, yada. And then look at this once again, beautiful, all green, all payments on time. So I guess by now you kind of like get the trend, right? Always make your payments on time. And if you find anything that is inaccurate, always check out the contact information so that you can sort things out with the lender. Now, let's continue to go along. And there's a section in particular that I also want you to pay close attention to. So one of them is the inquiries, right? Make sure that the inquiries that appear in your credit are accurate because remember, every time someone else checks your credit, your score goes down. So make sure that this inquiry over here from Bank of America is legit. The one from Capital One is legit and the other one from Capital One is legit. If it's legit, okay, leave it there. But if it's not legit, hey, contact the lender through this number and make sure they provide you some type of documentation so that you can use that and communicate with Experian in this case and have the inquiries removed from your profile because it is hurting your credit in a negative way, right? Now, another section I want you to pay attention to and that is public records. Make sure that whatever information appear on public records is accurate. Typically what you will find under the public records section it's anything related to bankruptcy. If you never had a bankruptcy, but you have it here in your file, make sure you take care of it because, hey, having a, a bankruptcy will make your life very difficult. Not the end of the world for sure, but it will make your life very difficult. So if the bankruptcy is inaccurate, make sure you contact Experian to have that removed. So always check your public records. Now, imagine this is you before and this is you after. So let's assume that before you have a total of four credit cards, right? And in those four credit cards, you have different credit lengths, right? So one, let's assume it was for two years. You have another one that it's good for 10 years. And then you have another car with a history of eight years. And then lastly, you have another one with a history of five years. So when you take two years, 10 years, eight and five, and then you average it to four different cars, you will have approximately a average of of 6.25, right? So you're gonna have a credit history average of roughly about six years, right? But let's say you come into the picture and you say, you know what? I don't wanna manage all of those cars. What I wanna do is actually eliminate this card right here, the one that is 10 years old. Why? Because it doesn't give me any cash back. It doesn't give me any points. It has a very high APR. Whatever the reason is it that you want to get rid of that card for, uh, think about it twice, right? Because what's gonna happen now is, let's take a new average. So now you have a car of two years, 
Now you have another car for eight years and then you have a car with five years. And then you divide that by three now because now you have one less car and that will give you an average of five years. So now you're actually eliminating one year worth of credit history in your profile. This is just a simple example, but imagine if you start closing out all of those credit cards. Now you went from having a credit history of 10 years to down to two years or maybe down to one year, perhaps even worse, down to six months. With that, I'm not saying that having a credit history of six months is a bad thing, but why would you want to go backwards, right? Now, you might probably wondering, okay, but that still sounds like it's a lot of work to maintain. It's a lot of hassle. What can I do to better manage those, you know, bunch of credit cards and still be able to get the benefits of it. So for that, you actually have two choices. So one thing you can do is to freeze your account. And it's as simple as just making a quick phone call, calling the bank and ask them, hey, I would like to freeze this account because it's currently not being used. And that's it. You get to maintain that credit history. The bank won't go ahead and cancel it because of the lack of use. And you can still maintain that long credit history and help you continue to boost that FICO score that you have. The second alternative, it's a little bit more hands-on, uh, it's a bit more creative, but it has a lot of benefits from it. So let's assume that um, you decided to not freeze your account to keep them um, active. And now you're trying to figure out how to keep them active in the best way possible. So let's assume you have five credit cards, right? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do one, two, three, four, five cards, right? So just make the lines right here. So let's say what you're gonna do, you're gonna assign them roles. So now each card has a role in your life, right? So let's say for example, card number one is gonna take care of gas payments, anything that's related to gas or transportation payments. Card two will be groceries only, right? So you got groceries in here. Now card number three will be your cell phone and car four will be your internet. And the last car, let's say, will be for utilities. So let's say electricity, right? So we wanna pay power, so electricity. You're not spending any additional money. You're spending the same amount of money. What you do is that you're changing the source now. So before, you will typically take cash or your debit card to buy gas or to pay for your groceries. Right now, what you're gonna do, you're not gonna use your cash anymore. You're actually gonna sign one credit card. And if it becomes very difficult, it's very easy to sort it out. All you gotta do is just to take a car and take a marker and just write on top of it what the car is gonna to be assigned for. So you write gas on the very top of it, you write groceries on top of it. So that way, when you're searching through your wallet, you're going to know exactly what are you going to use that car for. After you make your purchases, now what you're going to do is that you're going to take the same amount of money, the same cash that you would have normally used to make those expenses. Now you're going to use that same cash and pay off this credit card. So the wonderful benefits that you get out of it, it's one, you get to build a very, very strong credit history of you knowing how to use your credit responsibly and also making timely payments. And two, you're gonna reap the benefits of cash back, right? You're gonna accumulate points, whether you wanna use those points to travel for free or you wanna use those points as cash back so that way it can help you pay off some of this debt. 